hey, limnologists, let's learn about oxygen and carbon dioxide in lakes. And because it's really hard to see oxygen and carbon dioxide in water, here's the next best thing, frozen methane bubbles in the ice cover of Lake Baikal. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, I will have convinced you that a skilled limnologist can probably learn more about the nature of a lake from a series of oxygen determinations than from any other kind of chemical data. And this was a quote by G. Evelyn Hutchinson, a legendary ecologist who wrote a four-part volume called The Treaty on Limnology, which was a foundational textbook in the field. So here we're going to examine oxygen dynamics in four parts. We're going to talk about solubility, the sources and sinks of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and the vertical and temporal changes in oxygen in a lake. And while we're mostly going to talk about oxygen, what you'll see is that oxygen and carbon dioxide vary in tandem. And often if we know something about oxygen, we know something about carbon dioxide. We've already heard the term solubility when talking about ions in water. And while we often think of solubility in reference to a solid dissolving in a liquid, solubility can also refer to the ability of a gas to dissolve in a solvent, in this case in water. Overall, oxygen is not all that soluble in water. The maximum oxygen concentration at water at sea level and at zero degrees Celsius is just 14 parts per million, or 0.0014%. In comparison, the atmosphere is composed of nearly 21% oxygen. The solubility of gases are independent of other gases in solution, and carbon dioxide actually has a greater solubility than oxygen, but a gas like methane has a much lower solubility. In addition to the term solubility, we also use the term saturation, and this is the amount of gas water can hold. So at 100% saturation, the gas concentration in the water would be in equilibrium with the atmosphere. So in a freshwater lake at sea level and at zero degrees Celsius, if the oxygen concentration was 14.16 parts per million, that lake would be at saturation, or at 100% saturation. If the concentration of oxygen was higher than this, we would say that the lake was supersaturated. And if the concentration of oxygen was below this, we would say that the lake is undersaturated. We measure the concentration of oxygen in milligrams per liter, but we can also represent it as percent saturation. And this relative measurement sometimes makes more sense when we're thinking about biological processes. And the solubility of oxygen in water is affected by temperature, pressure, and salinity, which are all depicted in this graph on the right. And we can see that as water temperature increases, solubility decreases, which means there's less oxygen available in the water column. Similarly, as pressure increases, solubility also increases. This means a high alpine lake at an altitude with low atmospheric pressure would have lower oxygen solubility. And lastly, solubility is also impacted by salinity. The higher the salinity, the lower the oxygen concentration. Although you can see the difference in solubility between freshwater and ocean water is much more similar than between freshwater at one atmosphere and freshwater at two atmospheres, or even freshwater at zero degrees Celsius and freshwater at 30 degrees Celsius. So to review, at 100% saturation, which kind of lake would have more oxygen? A high altitude saline warm lake or a cold freshwater lake at sea level? Well, hopefully the answer is obvious from the graph on the previous slide a cold freshwater lake at sea level would have much more oxygen. And while there's lots of different types of lakes on Earth in many different habitats, if we're thinking about Wisconsin lakes that are generally fresh and pretty close to sea level, temperature is going to have the greatest effect on oxygen solubility throughout the year. And we can see in this table that at zero degrees Celsius, the oxygen solubility is about 14 milligrams per liter, and it's about half that as the temperature rises to 30 degrees Celsius. We can also view the same data as a graph where we see this line of decreasing solubility as temperature increases. And if we find that the concentrations of oxygen in a lake fall above this line, we say the lake is supersaturated, and the lake would be a source of oxygen to the atmosphere. However, if the concentrations of oxygen fall below this line, the lake would be undersaturated in oxygen, and the lake would be a sink of oxygen from the atmosphere to the water column. So what are the processes that affect oxygen concentration in a lake? The first is purely physical, and this is the tendency for oxygen in a lake to want to equilibrate with oxygen in the atmosphere. And this means if we ignored all other sources and sinks of oxygen, a lake would always be at 100% saturation with the atmosphere. So if a lake is super saturated, it's going to lose oxygen to the atmosphere to try and regain equilibrium. Likewise, if a lake is undersaturated, it's going to gain oxygen from the atmosphere. Oxygen can also be introduced from a lake from other hydrological inputs like rivers, groundwater, or melting glacial ice. But here we're going to focus on the biological sources of oxygen, and this is production through photosynthesis, leading to increased oxygen concentration, and also consumption of oxygen through biological respiration 
and through a variety of chemical and biochemical oxidation reduction processes, better known as redox reactions. Let's take a closer look at photosynthesis. This is the process by which algae convert light energy into chemical energy, and is probably one of the most important reactions in all of biology. Here we see that photosynthesis is a light-mediated reaction that takes carbon dioxide and water and converts it to glucose and oxygen. Therefore, photosynthesis is a source of oxygen and a sink of carbon dioxide. In reverse, the equation for photosynthesis is actually the equation for cellular respiration. And this is a set of metabolic reactions that use glucose and oxygen to produce energy with carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. Respiration occurs in living cells, but it's also the process mediated by bacteria through which living things are decomposed. When living things die, organisms are decomposed by bacteria, and that organic carbon is converted to CO2. And so often we use the terms respiration and decomposition interchangeably when referring to the consumption of oxygen in lakes. So it's important to remember that photosynthesis is a source of oxygen and a sink of carbon dioxide, whereas respiration and decomposition are sinks of oxygen and sources of carbon dioxide. And the balance between these two processes play an important role in the overall oxygen concentrations in aquatic ecosystems. So if we think about a lake ecosystem, what's photosynthesizing and what's respiring? Well, photosynthesizers are algae and plants, and these are the oxygen producers in lakes. But while photosynthesis is restricted to just a few organisms, almost all living cells respire. The only exception is some microbes, which respire anaerobically. So oxygen supersaturation in a lake can occur when photosynthesis adds oxygen faster than oxygen can diffuse out of the lake into the atmosphere, or be respired by other organisms. And lakes are undersaturated when cellular respiration removes oxygen faster than oxygen can be produced from photosynthesis or diffuse into the lake from the atmosphere. And so the distribution and variability of oxygen in a lake can tell us a lot about the biology. How oxygen varies with depth is the net effect of equilibration, production, and consumption. You can see here oxygen profiles from five different Austrian lakes. In all five, the oxygen concentration in the epilimian tends to be around saturation, around 10 milligrams per liter. But below 10 meters depth, the oxygen concentration widely varies between the five lakes. And again, this is a result of the net effect of production and consumption. And limnologists have classified oxygen profiles according to their shape. So let's take a look at these different types. Before we start, we should note that we're thinking about these oxygen profiles in the summer when the lake is stratified, because that would tell us the most about biological processes. During spring and fall turnover, when the lake is well mixed and isothermal, oxygen profiles are usually at 100% saturation. The first oxygen profile we're going to look at is the orthograde oxygen curve. And this is when oxygen remains at 100% saturation throughout the water column. You'll actually see oxygen concentrations increase in the hypolimnion, and this is because water temperatures are colder and the solubility of oxygen is higher. And we tend to see orthograde oxygen curves in oligotrophic lakes, lakes with low rates of photosynthesis or low production, and also very low rates of respiration. And in these lakes, the dominant process affecting the oxygen profile is equilibration with the atmosphere. The next type of profile is a clinograde oxygen curve. And this is where we see hypolimnetic oxygen depletion. And this is a result of high levels of oxygen consuming processes. Clinograde oxygen curves are commonly seen in really productive lakes. These are lakes with a lot of algal growth. And what happens is when that algae dies, it sinks into the hypolimnion and the cells are decomposed by bacteria. And during that decomposition process, oxygen is consumed. A third type of oxygen profile is a positive heterograde curve. This is where we see increases in oxygen concentration at the thermocline, and this is due to high levels of photosynthesis at the thermocline. And we often refer to this as a deep chlorophyll maximum, having the highest concentrations of algae at depth as opposed at the surface. And positive heterograde curves are common in oligotrophic lakes, where light is able to penetrate to the metalimnion, and so algae preferentially grow at the metalimnion, in this sweet spot where they have enough light availability from the surface and they also get nutrient input from the hypolimnion. The last type of oxygen profile we're going to talk about is a negative heterograde curve. And this has the opposite shape of the positive heterograde curve, where we see an oxygen decrease in the thermocline. And this can be due to respiration of algae at night or respiration of a dense layer of zooplankton. So let's review our four oxygen profiles. We have orthograde curves, which tend to be found in oligotrophic lakes, where oxygen is typically at 100% saturation. We also have clinograde curves, and this is where we see a lot of respiration in the hypolimnion and sometimes a complete loss of oxygen. 
and these are common in highly productive eutrophic lakes. We also have positive heterograde curves, and these are common in low nutrient lakes where we get light penetration all the way down to the metalimnion and deep chlorophyll maximum. And lastly, we have negative heterograde curves, which in general are pretty rare, but this is where we see oxygen consumption at the thermocline. So now that we broadly understand oxygen production and consumption in a lake, let's look at temporal changes in oxygen over a 24-hour cycle. And changes at this time scale are going to be a result of respiration versus photosynthesis. Here's a plot of surface carbon dioxide and surface oxygen concentrations from Cranberry Bog in Wisconsin. Over three days, you can see the carbon dioxide concentrations increasing at night and decreasing during the day. Opposite to this, you can see the oxygen concentrations decreasing during the night and increasing during the day. So what's going on? Well, it's all controlled by photosynthesis and respiration. During the day, when there's sunlight, algae photosynthesize, producing oxygen, and so oxygen concentrations increase. And photosynthesis also uses carbon dioxide, and so carbon dioxide will decrease. Then at night, when the sun goes down, photosynthesis shuts down, and cellular respiration is the dominant process in the water column. And so carbon dioxide concentrations increase, and oxygen concentrations decrease. And on a bright sunny day, this process is very evident in the surface concentrations in a lake. So here's a question to review what we've just learned. Here are the daily changes in percent saturation in the epilimnetic waters of three lakes. One of the lakes is Trout Lake, a large oligotrophic lake. Another one is Lake Mendota, a large eutrophic lake. And the third is Trout Bog, a small dystrophic bog lake. So based on what we've learned, which lake do you think matches which pattern? Okay, I'll give you a hint. The bog lake is the brown line. And this might have been confusing because we haven't talked about bog lakes yet. But even though they have really dark stained water, they can be very productive, especially in the epilimnion. And here we can see that trout bog actually has large daily changes in dissolved oxygen. Okay, what about the other two? Which one is trout lake and which one is Lake Mendota? Well, I hope you said Lake Mendota is the green line, because it has much larger fluctuations in daily oxygen concentration. This makes sense because Lake Mendota is eutrophic and has high algal productivity, and therefore the oxygen concentrations are going to get really high during the day. On the other hand, Trout Lake is oligotrophic and has much lower rates of productivity, and therefore the daily change in dissolved oxygen is much lower. In fact, the dissolved oxygen in Trout Lake is always around saturation. So now that we understand daily changes in oxygen, let's think about annual changes and how thermal mixing regimes, photosynthesis, and respiration play a role. Here's a 40-year time series of dissolved oxygen concentrations in Trout Lake, a deep oligotrophic lake in northern Wisconsin. So what do we see? Well, we actually see supersaturation of dissolved oxygen around 10 meters during some parts of the year. And we also see very low dissolved oxygen concentrations near the bottom of the lake although this seems to be changing on a biannual scale. So let's take a look at a single year and see what's happening. Here are dissolved oxygen concentrations from profiles in 2018, where the black dots denote manual measurements. The heat map interpolates between these manual measurements, and some of the interpolations between dots can be misleading, especially when oxygen concentrations change rapidly at spring and fall turnover. So there's a few important things to be aware of in this plot. First off in January and February, we can see that there's low concentrations of oxygen at the very bottom of the lake. The loss of oxygen is common in ice-covered lakes in the winter, when photosynthesis is very low due to a lack of light. In the spring, around May 1st, we see that the entire water column is well oxygenated. And this would have been because the lake would have just experienced spring turnover, and the entire water column would have been mixed and replenished with atmospheric oxygen. As the summer progresses, we see two important things happening. One, is an increase in oxygen in the metalimnion to levels above saturation. And the second is a progressive loss of oxygen in the hypolimnion. So two things are happening. One is we have a metalimnetic oxygen maximum, similar to a positive heterograde curve, where we have maximum rates of photosynthesis, the metalimnion. We also have high levels of decomposition in the hypolimnion, and so oxygen is progressively being consumed during the summer, although there's still oxygen available in the water column. It's not until the fall until early November that we see complete turnover of the lake and a replenishment of oxygen throughout the water column. And if we were to look at years other than 2018, we would see the same annual pattern happening every year, although the timing would be slightly different 
due to that year's weather. So in contrast to Trout Lake, let's take a look at dissolved oxygen in Lake Mendota. Lake Mendota is a similarly deep lake like the Trout Lake, but it's very eutrophic, with high nutrient concentrations that fuel algal growth. In this 30-year time series of dissolved oxygen, we can see a similar annual pattern to what we saw in Trout Lake, except the loss of oxygen in the hypolimnion looks much stronger. So let's take a look at an individual year. Here's dissolved oxygen in 2019. We can see that in April, the water column is well oxygenated. Again, this would have been just after spring turnover. After the lake begins to stratify in June, what we see is rapid depletion of dissolved oxygen in the hypolimnion and complete loss of oxygen in some parts of the water column. At the same time, we see supersaturation of oxygen in the epilimnion, but in contrast to Trout Lake where we saw a positive heterograde curve, the high oxygen is right at the surface. We refer to areas of the lake that have lost oxygen as being anoxic, and areas of the lake that have oxygen as oxic. Because Lake Mendota is a eutrophic lake, we see clinograde oxygen curves every year, with the hypolimnion going anoxic in summer. And this is a major problem for organisms trying to live in the lake. Just like humans, all aquatic organisms need oxygen to breathe. Okay, okay, well there's some microbes that don't, but most do. And so if there's no oxygen in the hypolimnion, organisms need to move up in the water column to survive. But the water at the surface of the lake is very warm, and there's a lot of species that are cold adapted, including popular fish species like walleye. And we refer to this problem as the oxythermal squeeze, where species are squeezed into this tiny layer in the metalimnion, where it's cold enough for them to survive, but also has enough oxygen. And you can imagine if you were a cold water fish, you'd be pretty stressed trying to survive in this lake environment. Just like walleye, cisco are a deep cold water fish species, once very common in Wisconsin lakes. But with a loss of cold water habitat in the hypolimnion, the result is fish die off. Here's an incredible demonstration of oxythermal squeeze from fish tagging of cisco in a Minnesota lake. So cisco prefer habitats with temperatures less than 20 degrees and dissolved oxygen greater than 4 milligrams per liter. And you can see that in this lake. That means by July and August, the fish are squeezed into a very narrow range in the lake around 6 meters depth. And because the fish were tagged, we can actually see where they were living in the lake. We can see that in May, the fish occupied a range of depths, from almost near the surface to around 8 meters depth. But as summer progressed and the epilimnion warmed and oxygen decreased in the hypolimnion, the fish were restricted to this thin layer in the metalimnion. And it wasn't until fall turnover that their habitat increased. In addition to tracking the fish's location, they also measured the fish's internal body temperature. And they saw that during this oxythermal squeeze in August, the fish's temperature actually increased, which means the fish was stressed. And so this lake is no longer an ideal habitat for cisco. They're being threatened from warming from above and eutrophication from below. So if warming and eutrophication continue, the small amount of habitat could completely cease to exist. So the loss of oxygen in a lake means big ecological change. With no oxygen, we see the absence of many organisms, only microbes. And when we start losing oxygen, we also see different types of chemical reactions, which are important for nutrient cycling. Oxygen is the preferred oxidizing agent in many chemical reactions, and in the absence of oxygen, many microbes start using other oxidizing agents, such as nitrate, iron, or sulfate. And this changes the water chemistry and can have feedbacks on biology.